His name was Cunningham, and he was the leader of our group when we landed on Red Beach One. Corporal Roy William Rausch of F Company, 2nd Marines, was a native of Alva, Oklahoma, who joined the service when he was 17 years old. I've forgotten his first name, he said, but I'll never forget what he did that day when three tanks charged our lines. Each of the group leaders, including Cunningham, was equipped with what they called an anti-tank grenade. It was about the size of a thick fountain pen that you could bolt onto the end of your rifle and then fire at a tank. It would become an anti-tank missile for maybe 50 feet or so. When one of the tanks got so close you could almost spit on it, Cunningham hit it in the tread. The tank was crippled. The Japanese quickly realised that there was no way they were going to get out of there. They tried to back out, but the tank just started to spin. Cunningham calmly fired another anti-tank grenade and hit the tank again, this time right below the turret. Japanese tanks were what we considered just plain junk, Roosh said. They were nowhere near the type of tank our Shermans were, or even the light tanks we had before that. Their protective metal wasn't very thick at all, and Cunningham's shot easily penetrated the tank and exploded. Several Japanese tried to exit the tank through the turret, but Cunningham leaped up on top of the tank and threw another grenade inside, destroying it and the whole crew. The remaining two Japanese tanks retreated as fast as possible toward the town of Garapan. About that time, a large mortar barrage struck the area, lasting maybe 15 or 20 minutes. No one could see anything for all the dust going up. For a minute, Roosh thought everyone had been killed. When the barrage lifted, he moved forward. The first person he saw was Cunningham. For knocking out that tank and the crew, Cunningham received a medal. Roosh didn't get much sleep that night because the Japanese kept moving down toward the Marines. All through the night they heard the sound of the Japanese trucks coming. Roosh could hear where they stopped and turned their motors off. Then, about 1am, they decided to stage a Banzai charge. I wasn't sure how many there were, probably at least 200, and they came right down the road toward our position, Roosh said. Our machine guns were plenty busy for a while. We had a lot of machine guns along the road because we knew that's where they would be coming from. The second attack was about the same number, and right in the middle of that second charge, a Navy ship fired a star shell and lit up the whole area for miles around. Every Japanese was slaughtered, said Roosh. Not a one of them got through. They later reported 1,600 Japanese bodies right out there in front of the Marines' little platoon after it was over. Rausch walked on up to his foxhole position. There was Cunningham, lying next to where his foxhole had been. The one-man killer of tanks was lying on his back. He was covered with blood and looked like he was dead. Roosh asked a sergeant sitting there, Is that Cunningham? The sergeant nodded. Is he alive? Roosh asked, and the sergeant shook his head. Roosh walked over and touched Cunningham and whispered his name. Cunningham opened his eyes and looked at me remembered Roosh, and it scared the hell out of me. I thought a dead man had come back to life. Cunningham had been shot through the right side. He had also been shot on the cheekbone below his eye, and that bullet had exited through his ear. A third bullet had struck him in his lower neck. That round had lodged in his body. He also had another bullet wound near his heart. When Roush opened his canteen, Cunningham grabbed it with both hands and started chugging water. Roush knew that so much water could make a thirsty man sick, so after he drank about half of it, Roosh pulled it away. There weren't any stretchers in the area, but a small Japanese shack stood maybe a hundred yards away. Roush got one of the other guys to go with him, and they tore off a door and then used it to carry Cunningham to an aid station. Roush didn't see how he could possibly live with all those wounds, but at least he could say he tried. Roush found out later how Cunningham had been shot up so severely. Earlier that morning, a group of engineers had pulled a light 37mm cannon off the road and taken it down onto the sandy beach where they could get a better field of fire. Within minutes, the men attempting to fire the gun were either killed or wounded. But here came Cunningham again, said Roush. He manned the gun by himself and got off a series of shots with it until a Japanese machine gun finally found him and riddled him with bullets. When Cunningham was left at the aid station, everyone who saw him was certain he would soon die. About six months later, Roush got rotated back to the States. While in the Chow Line at the Marine Corps depot in San Diego, 
he saw Cunningham in uniform standing in line. He thought for a minute he was seeing a ghost, but he slowly walked up to him. How are you doing? Rouge said. Well, I still can't hear anything out of this ear, Cunningham said, but other than that, I'm okay. By the morning of 16 June, everything about Saipan had changed. On 15 June, when the landings began, Admiral Richmond Kelly Turner had been jauntily predicting that Saipan would collapse within a week. Now Turner and Lieutenant General Holland Smith faced the disturbing news that none of their marine units had managed to get more than halfway to their objectives on the opening day of battle. It was clear that the initial plans had underestimated the size of the Japanese forces on Saipan. It was also clear that the Army's 27th Infantry Division, which had been originally slated as the reserve force for Saipan, and that Holland Smith didn't trust in the slightest, would have to be committed to the battle. After his experience with the 27th at Mackin and Enivatok, Smith was reluctant to use them again in the Marianas. But they were the only troops available in Hawaii, so he had to take them. The 6th Marines were busy mopping up pockets of Japanese resistance behind the United States lines, left there after the counter-attack of the previous evening. Their work proceeded at a slow pace, finding the Japanese in their holes and using grenades and flamethrowers to flush them out. Meanwhile, the 8th and 23rd Marines linked up at Sharon Kanoa, closing a dangerous gap in the lines by moving up to the edge of Lake Susupe, a shallow body of water, and pausing there. Early on the morning of 16 June, about 200 Japanese moved through another gap in the lines between divisions. Fortunately, troops from the 23rd Marines were able to hold on to their position and kill many of the advancing Japanese. That night, Holland Smith had ordered the 27th Division to begin landing its troops, and it was obvious by now that the Marines would need these reserves if they were to move ahead. Upon landing, the 27th pushed forward to Aslito Airfield, where they were about to surprise the unsuspecting Japanese. By the time darkness fell on 16 June, 20,000 Marines, if the dead and injured were included, had come ashore on Saipan. The troops had established a beachhead about 10,000 yards long and over a 1,000 yards deep in most places. Two divisions were in place with most of their reserves. Seven battalions of artillery had landed, and so had most of two tank battalions, the troops began to dig in. Both division command posts were set up, although the 6th Marine's regimental commander, Colonel James Risley, established his command post practically at the water's edge. The 4th Division commander, General Harry Schmidt, established a command post that was actually a series of foxholes about 50 yards from the beach. It was poorly protected from enemy light artillery, which was firing from the high ground some 1,500 yards away. Meanwhile, south of Afetna Point, the 4th Marine Division was having its own share of problems. Opposition in the rubble of the town of Charankanoa was comparatively light, but Japanese riflemen still sniped away at Marines as they moved through. As for the Japanese, their artillery had taken a heavy toll. The United States landings had been made against what the enemy considered his strongest points, at a time when the defending garrison was four battalions above strength, massing at least 16 105mm howitzers and 75mm field pieces on the nearest high ground. Directly east of the island's airstrip, they emplaced a 150mm four-weapon howitzer battery, with a similar battery south of it. All of these weapons were well situated, and they poured a tremendous amount of fire on the landing beaches. Many marines believed that if you heard the artillery shell, it most likely had already passed you by, and you wouldn't hear the one with your name on it because the shell arrived before the sound did. But Private First Class Richard Hertensteiner, who joined the Marines at 17 in his hometown of Sheboygan, Wisconsin, and was experiencing his first battle at Saipan, learned that it didn't always work that way. Hertensteiner, a member of an artillery battery, was talking to a couple of other Marines when they heard incoming sounds and dove into a shell crater. When the first round hit, he was the first person to fall into the hole. After the shelling, he got up and began talking to the other Marines again, but they were both dead. Hertensteiner never received so much as a small scratch. When Sergeant Hank Mikolak was 12 years old, he was pretty sure that when he got old enough he would join the Navy. That was an unhappy time for him, 
because his mother died that year, and his father decided to leave Louisiana and move back to Texas, where Hank had been born. They settled in the town of Marlin. Hank went part of the way through high school there, but deep inside he still heard the Navy calling him. He was working a summer job, putting a new roof on the high school, when he and a friend decided to go to Waco and volunteer for the Navy. The friend chickened out, but on the way to the Navy recruiting office, Hank happened to run into an old Marine who started telling him tales about China, and one thing led to another. When he left Waco, he was in the Marine Corps, 3rd Battalion, 2nd Marines. His father signed for him, and he wound up in San Diego going to boot camp. One weekend in December, Michalak was on liberty in Los Angeles when he heard about the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. He caught a ride back to Camp Elliott immediately. He found everybody talking about the bombing, fearful that the Japanese were going to hit the West Coast. His first assignment was Guadalcanal, a campaign he thought would never end. Then there was terrible Tarawa, where the Marines sustained more than 4,500 casualties in three days' time. The next operation turned out to be Saipan. Everyone was worried that it would become another Tarawa. When we pulled up there and I saw the size of that island, my first thought was, man, that's going to be a good deal, Michalak remembered. That was a big island compared to what Tarawa was. Saipan had mountains on it, big mountains, and we got ashore okay. The Japanese had it pretty well fortified, but we were able to land without the same kind of catastrophe that we had at Tarawa, and that was a relief. During the second day on Saipan, some of the second marines had advanced to the edge of the foothills of Mount Tapochao. The Japanese were on the high ground, and we knew or suspected that something was going on up there, Michalak said, but the problem was, we didn't know what. On the third night, at about two in the morning, the Japanese blew their bugles and came down that mountain like thunder, with artillery and tanks and anti-tank guns and anything else that would shoot. They completely overran the marines, and that was the end of Hank's operations on Saipan. He caught a bullet in the right elbow and some shrapnel in the hand. That was the last thing I remembered, Michalak said. The next thing I knew I was out on a ship, and they were wheeling me in to operate on my arm or do whatever they were going to do to it, and right there beside the door was a trash can with arms and legs sticking out of it that the doctors had just thrown in. I wasn't fully conscious, but I thought to myself, OK, that's where your arm is going, right there in that trash can. Michalak woke up with a cast on his arm and a separate cast on two of his knuckles that had been ripped off by the shrapnel. Eventually all the wounds healed up. It would be six days before the beachhead was considered totally secure, but it was the first day's action that was most important. After that day, the most critical stage of the most critical stage in the invasion was behind the Marines. They, at least, were ashore. Nightfall came, but it brought no peace. The Marines dug in on their narrow strip of beachhead with the Philippine Sea at their backs and a vengeful enemy lurking in the darkness. Every Marine knew that a night counterattack lay ahead and it wasn't long in coming. The Japanese High Command had already issued orders to drive the Americans back into the sea before daylight the next day. The army this evening will make a night attack with all its forces. The 31st Army radioed Tokyo and expects to annihilate the enemy at one swoop to Japanese troops, the order was plain and simple. Each unit will consolidate strategically important points and will carry out counterattacks with reserve forces and tanks against the enemy landing units and will demolish the enemy during the night at the water's edge. The 6th Marines, 2nd Division, which held the left flank of the beachhead, was the first to feel the effects of these measures. A large force of Japanese infantry, supported by tanks, charged the American lines from the north along the coastal road. With swords waving, flags flying and a bugle sounding, the Japanese descended on the marine lines. The regiment under attack had only one battalion of 75mm pack howitzers at its disposal because they had been unable to land any of their 105mm howitzer battalions the previous day. Naval star shells fired from United States destroyers silhouetted the attackers as they approached, and the withering fire of machine guns, rifles and naval five-inch guns stopped the attack. The battle evolved into a madhouse of noise, tracers and flashing lights as the tank attack came at us out of Garapan and hit our battalion on the left. 
Major James Donovan of the 1st Battalion, 6th Marines, remembered those times. He had fought his way through Guadalcanal and Tarawa. The Marines had been warned that an enemy tank formation would be coming down in their direction, so they were well prepared for it. They were all dug in about eight or nine hundred yards from the beach, and at about 3.30 they heard the Japanese tanks coming. In addition to the Navy's star shells, the Marines had their own star shells with their 60mm mortars, so the area was well lit up. It was an eerie scene out there, Donovan said. The flashing shells, the smoke drifting around, and as soon as we heard the tanks out in front, we called in our supporting artillery fire and all our own supporting weapons, mortars, anti-tank grenades, bazookas and demolition charges. As enemy tanks were hit and set afire, they illuminated other tanks coming out of the flickering shadows toward the front. In the dense darkness, Marines saw only a few tanks at a time. Moving out of their holes, they attacked them with anti-tank grenades, bazookas and hand grenades. Then Marine machine guns opened up, and the Japanese foot soldiers following the tanks were badly cut up. Before that battle was over, they had destroyed 27 to 30 tanks, and the supporting infantrymen were all dead. That tank battle went into the record books as the largest of the Pacific War up to that time. When the confrontation ended after about 45 minutes, the 6th Marines had polished off 24 of the tanks in hand-to-hand -hand fighting. The Marine bazookas had proved amazingly effective against those thin-skinned Japanese tanks of that period, said Donovan. There were no prisoners among the foot soldiers. We killed them all. Among the men who became heroes that day was 20-year-old Sergeant Jim Evans of the 6th Marines. He'd been a Marine for four years and had seen action at Pearl Harbor, Guadalcanal and Tarawa. When a Japanese tank stopped near him and the hatch opened to allow the driver to peer through the smoke, Evans shot the driver and hurled a phosphorus grenade into the tank. Not far away, Corporal William Jefferies and his buddy, Private First Class Bob Reed, both of the 6th Marines, fired their bazooka shells and knocked out four enemy tanks. Reed received a Navy Cross for jumping on top of a fifth tank and disabling it with an incendiary grenade in the turret. Jeffries received a Silver Star. The 8th Marines, meanwhile, were pushing east in the seemingly endless swampland around Lake Susup. Men found themselves standing waist-deep in muck that stretched a thousand yards north and south of the lake. The area was covered with nests of snipers, with Japanese soldiers holding positions both in the swamp and to the east and south of the lake. Simultaneously, the 2nd Marines moved up the coast toward Garapan, and the 6th Marines moved northeast toward the densely defended hills. Navy battleships and cruisers, those that hadn't accompanied Admirals Raymond Spruance and Mark Mitcher on their turkey shoot in the Philippine Sea, began a heavy bombardment of Garapan. It was a town already pounded and flattened by naval gunfire. The city was gone by the time we occupied it, remembered medical corpsman Chester Zeck, who carried a .45 caliber pistol and a carbine, and whose marine uniform was similar to an infantryman. The entire population had moved into the hills and nearby caves. Small clusters of Japanese troops hidden among the ruins of the town seemed at first to be the only opposition, but that afternoon seven tanks showed up. The marines responded with bazookas and grenades until six of the tanks were destroyed. I was criticised for being too much of a marine and not enough of a pharmacist's mate, recalled H. L. Obermiller, who had somehow managed to join the navy and in some peculiar fashion had ended up in the Marine Corps as a pharmacist's mate. The youngster from Milam County, Texas, took a troop train to San Diego, where he was sworn in, went through boot camp, and then had a chance to leave the Navy and join the Marines, so I grabbed it, he said. From the beginning, pharmacist's mate Obermiller enjoyed carrying a rifle, and he was pretty good with it. He liked to go out with the Marines, and he could shoot as well as they could. He could also outwalk them, as he'd been raised on a farm and had to walk three or four miles to school every day. He didn't wear the Red Cross emblem on his sleeve as they did at Guadalcanal, where the Japanese used the Red Cross for target practice. But he knew that if the Japanese on Saipan could pick out a pharmacist's mate or an officer, they would shoot the pharmacist's mate first. When Obermiller's Higgins boat landed on Saipan, the sky was lit up with shells and flares. As they made their way through the town of Garapan, an officer called out to him. 
There are some navy frogmen who came ashore on the wrong side of town, he said. Now they're behind Japanese lines and they've gotten ambushed. You think you can get them out? Obermiller said he would try. So I go down there and get to the Japanese lines, and there was a fence I crawled under. I found the guys, and there were six or seven of them. But I never heard any of them speak a word, I guess because they were too scared. I got them out of there by crawling on our bellies back to our lines. I told them to line up behind me one by one and walk up the main street. As I walked, I shouted, Marines coming through, Marines coming through, so the United States sentries wouldn't shoot us, he said. So I got them all the way to sick bay and then went back to my bunk. From that point on, it was rough going. The Japanese decided that they would come down and hit us, and they were well trained and potent, he said. They didn't seem to have any scruples at all. They didn't care if they got killed or not. I don't know how I did it. I knew I was walking into sudden death, but somehow that was just the way it was. With the Marines, you're trained to just accept things as they come. You don't question orders. When the officer has one more stripe than you do, when he says jump, you jump. Even with the help of a pharmacist's mate, it would take the second Marines until 3 July to root out the last of the Japanese from their underground caves and pillboxes amid the carnage of Garapan. Sergeant Arwin Bowden, who was born in Wichita Falls, Texas, was a radio and telephone man, and that first night he set up his radio in a concrete building in Garapan that originally had been a Japanese burial crypt. Shelves ran all the way around the crypt and urns were everywhere. About two o'clock in the morning the Japanese made their final run at us, Bowden recalled, and they lost five of their 10th Marines 105mm artillery pieces in that blast. By daylight we were back in the lines and it was kill or be killed. That was all there was to it, Bowden said. In an area about half a mile square, there were about 3,000 Japanese bodies. They sent in bulldozers to cut trenches. Then the same bulldozers just pushed the bodies into the trenches and covered them up. Some of the Japanese surrendered, but some of them wouldn't. Those that wouldn't should have. Privates First Class Samuel Red Spencer and Jack Wren were both from Michigan, and they joined the 2nd Marine Division at the same time. We saw a movie about the Marines wearing their dress blues and thought we'd really look sharp in those blues when we joined up in September 1942, remembered Spencer. Their first action was at Tarawa. It was pretty rough, remembered Wren. I carried a wounded guy down to the beach, but he'd been shot in the head and was dead by the time I got there. Our colonel was a very good guy, but he died trying to get off the water. In the space of a few hours, there weren't any officers left, and a sergeant was running everything. They ended up on separate boats at Saipan. We were all over hell trying to find each other, but at the end of the battle neither one of us could find the other one, said Spencer. Both thought the other was dead. When Jack was located he was in Garapan, in street to street, house to house fighting. You had to go one house at a time, room to room, said Spencer. You never knew where the Japanese were. They were everywhere. During the day Marines could move up close behind the tanks and walk, and the Japanese stayed away because of the tanks. Instead, they waited until night and came in. If they came during the day, we would stand still and knock them off, Spencer said. A guy in my outfit had a Browning automatic rifle, but he got hit and had to leave, and I took over the Browning automatic rifle. I knocked off a bunch of Japanese. I told the other guys that I would shoot high and they would shoot low to make sure we got all of them. That was the only time I had a Browning automatic rifle, and I'm really glad I did. A few days later, Spencer was on the lower levels of Mount Tapochao, the biggest mountain on Saipan, and it was a bad place to be. When Spencer and a group of Marines came out of the jungle into a clearing, he got hit in the back with shrapnel and was knocked out cold. When he woke, he looked up to see the blue sky. It was strangely quiet, and the Marines around him were all dead, and he thought he was dead too. This must be what heaven looks like, he thought. Then a big sergeant came through and kicked him with his boot. When Spencer turned to look at him, he heard him yell, Hey! Red's alive! Get over here! Several men appeared and gave him morphine, and others carried him down to where he could be put on a jeep. Next thing he knew, he was on a ship. Boy, he thought, isn't this nice? Wren didn't find Spencer until he was back in Hawaii. He came running over to where I was, and I heard him yelling, Where's Spencer? Where's Spencer? I thought for all the world Jack was dead.
Seeing him was quite a shock, said Spencer. Private First Class Wayne Terwilliger was remembering the day he joined the Marines. It seemed ages ago, but it had been less than a year. After high school he'd enrolled at Western Michigan University, it was a big baseball school, and he knew if he did okay there, it could mean a contract for him with a professional ball club. He played shortstop and was pretty good for a kid who only weighed 130 pounds. But that first semester was tough. He ended up with an A, a B and a C. But there was an F in there too, and he went to talk to Dr Russell Siebert, his history professor, about his grades, hoping against hope that there was a way to sidestep the F and keep playing baseball. I'll have to give it up, he said. Unless I can do something about this grade, they won't let me play baseball anymore. I'm sorry, son. Dr. Siebert said, but that's just the way things are. There's nothing I can do. Terwilliger was crestfallen, but he tried not to show it. Hell, I'm going down to the Marine Corps, he said. I think those blue and white Marine uniforms are real pretty. I'll see if they'll let me join up. Well, said Dr. Siebert, shrugging, good luck in the Marines. In lots of ways, the Marines had been good luck. The train was crowded as they headed west for San Diego, and it was the first time he'd ever been out of the state of Michigan. He'd even enjoyed boot camp. He'd never shot a gun before, but he made expert as easy as pie. The drill instructor was kind of an easygoing guy, and they got along fine. He was good at Morse code, so they assigned him to an amphibious tank. He still wasn't sure why. Now the whole crew of the tank was huddled outside, with the tank itself a few yards away. Private First Class Billy Schrader spotted something moving on top of the tank. Hey, listen, he whispered, a Japanese out there messing around the tank. He raised his gun and fired. I think I got him. Several members of the crew crept out to check. The Japanese was dead with a bullet through the side of his head. He had a lot of ammo with him. He could have easily blown the tank to hell and back if Schrader hadn't seen him. The second lieutenant that was in charge of us said we'd ended up on the wrong beach and we had to move down. Remembered Private First Class Bill L. Steele, a kid from Nashville with the Second Marines. So he started moving us down this railroad track with us hollering at him, Get us off, get us off, it's too wide open out here. The lieutenant said, I know what I'm doing and just about then the shells started falling and I got hit. A shell hit between his feet and he went flying through the air. When he landed, he was a little dazed, but he was still pretty mobile. He'd been wounded in the left ankle, left leg and left hand, and he had sand and gravel in his nose, ears and mouth. He got out of there and took cover under a tree, where he grabbed somebody's machine gun and started firing. When it was over, there were 42 of us in the platoon, and only 19 of us were able to walk out, Steele said. The second day on Saipan, I was evacuated out to a merchant marine ship, where they dug the shrapnel out of me and put me back ashore. On the fifth day, I was back in the front lines on the side of Mount Tapochau. One of the most intriguing stories about the early days of the invasion involved the tall brick smokestack of a sugarcane refinery in Charan Kanoa. Although the American naval barrage had gutted the town, many marines believed the smokestack had been purposely spared as a visual guide for the incoming Amtraks, the smokestack looked like it had been pierced a thousand times, but it still stood. After a few days, the Marines discovered that a Japanese hiding in the smokestack was directing artillery fire on United States forces. As a forward observer, he had been looking down on them the whole time. Marines in the vicinity experienced destructive damage from Japanese mortars for about two and a half days until someone discovered the spotter. The smokestack and the spotter were quickly destroyed. For Privates First Class Jack Gilbreth and James V. Reed, both 4th Division Marines, the terrors of Saipan were almost a letdown in a manner of speaking. Gilbreth, from Tiny Mercury, Texas, and Reed, from Pine River, Minnesota, had already experienced a heart-stopping tragedy before even leaving Pearl Harbor, a raging runaway fire in which 163 sailors and Marines had died and 396 were injured. By jumping into the water as flames and explosions rocked his landing ship, Tank Gilbreth escaped with only a few minor burns, while dozens of others died a tragic death in one of the strangest and most bizarre disasters of the war. It happened in the West Lock area of Pearl Harbor, where 29 landing ship Tank were tied up, beam to beam, at six different piers.
It happened on a Sunday. Half of their rifle companies had liberty, while the other half stayed aboard the landing ship tank. Gilbreth was up on deck, reading a book, when he heard an explosion down below. He wondered what it was. When a second explosion occurred, he knew he had to get off the ship, something was terribly wrong. He threw down the book, ran to the side of the landing ship, tank, and jumped off. Soon a Higgins boat picked him up. When the third explosion hit, the fire hadn't gotten back to the main wheelhouse, where it was stocked with anti-aircraft ammunition. But when it blew, the ship just folded up like a big horseshoe and sank, Gilbreth recalled. All the other landing ship tank were locked in at the same pier, and it was impossible for them to get away from the fire, which covered everything in a matter of minutes, so they burned up too, along with all the marines' sea bags, rifles and just about everything else. Gilbreth was taken to a hospital and checked all over, but he had only a few superficial burns. The Navy did everything they could, he said. They pulled a lot of men out of the water, but many others drowned or were killed. Those who were rescued remained at Pearl Harbor for about a week, waiting for new landing ship Tank from the States. When Reed awakened in the early light of Sunday morning, it looked as though the whole bloody world was on fire aboard landing ship Tank 143. I'd taken my shower and crawled into bed because I'd had liberty the night before, he recalled. I hadn't been asleep very long, not more than about twenty minutes, and when I opened my eyes all I could see was flames in every direction. Reed was sleeping in an upper berth, and he jumped onto the floor, which was about eight feet down, hitting his leg as he did. I don't know what I hit, but my leg was so sore I could hardly move on it, he said. But I jumped in the water and started swimming. He hadn't gone far when a large sailor pulled him out. Sometime later, Reed could hear the sound of explosions, and an ambulance came and outfitted him with some clothes. All he had on was shorts, and took him down to the docks. His leg was black and blue by then, and he was all torn up. But at least he was alive. A press blackout was enforced, and Navy personnel were ordered not to talk about the incident. The disaster was classified information until 1960. Even today it is still not well known. As it turned out, the Japanese on Saipan had some surprises up their sleeves, surprises that even took Gilbreth's breath away. Reed was still hobbling around from his landing ship, tank injury, when he got to Saipan, so his commanding officer told him he didn't have to go in with the rest of the troops. In a few days, though, he went in anyway. One of the most miserable things I saw on Saipan was one night when the Japanese had some civilians out in front of them, and they drove the women and children right into our front lines, he said. Naturally, the Marines didn't know anything about this, and they started firing, and, oh my God, they killed most of those women and children. One of the poor guys, he had a Browning automatic rifle, and he was the one who'd done a lot of the killing. When he could see what had happened, he took his own life. Then there was this little girl about four or five years old hiding in a cave, Reed said. The Saipan children were dying of dehydration, but they wouldn't touch the water unless one of the marines tasted it first. The Japanese had told them that the Americans were going to kill them. We had a big can that we poured the water out of, and this kid was reaching out with a cup she had when her mother came along. Just as the girl was holding out her cup, her mother jerked her away, I can still see the expression on that kid's face. It was a little thing, I guess, but it made me feel kind of sick. I knew how thirsty she was. A Japanese officer was also found hiding inside the cave, and an interpreter started talking to him, trying to get him to come out. Instead, the officer started shooting, and one of the bullets hit Reed in the back of the neck. He was transported to the hospital ship, the USS Solstice, and survived. It was the fourth or fifth day, Private First Class Ray Renfro wasn't sure. He couldn't remember the last time he had slept. All I knew was that we went day and night with no sleep, and I lost count of the days, Renfro remembered. We ran out of water too. None of the Marines knew where the Japanese were, but the Japanese seemed to know exactly where they were. They were constantly shooting at the Marines from holes in the ground. We heard a shot, and the wind went right by my ear. And of course we all hit the dirt, he said. The longer I lay there, the madder I got. I took the safety off that old Browning automatic rifle and jumped up and ran right up to that hole in the ground, firing that thing as I went, spraying bullets everywhere when I got up there. But damn, I'd run completely out of ammunition, 
and I had to move fast and get out of the way. Renfro got behind a tree to reload his Browning automatic rifle with twenty fresh rounds. Meanwhile, a close friend of his, Private First Class Gerald Vandermeer, ran up beside him. If you'll get a grenade ready, Renfro said, I'll jump out and fire, and you pitch the grenade at them. But something went wrong. As Vandermeer jumped out and threw the grenade, the Japanese shot him right in the gut. He was my foxhole buddy, and he didn't make it, Renfro said. I sat there and listened to him groan for a long time before he died. That wasn't the end of it. Two more marines ran up to where Renfro was standing behind the tree, and the Japanese shot them both in the head. They hit the ground and didn't move. Renfro never knew how the Japanese missed him, but they did. Finally, they got a half-track up there with a 75mm cannon, he said, and he pulled up close and fired straight on into that hole. That was the last we ever heard from those Japanese. When platoon sergeant George Gray began feeling homesick, sometimes he'd close his eyes and remember the time when he and his whole 4th Marine Division company were making a name for themselves on the silver screen. They'd been training at Oceanside, California, when a movie crew descended upon them and started filming Guadalcanal Diary, based on the best-selling book by Richard Tregaskis. Gray's whole company was invited to participate. We spent the better part of six weeks surrounded by movie stars, remembered Gray, a young man from Arkansas who was an Amtrak driver. The actors were playing the roles of Marines carrying out the landing at Guadalcanal, but it got scary when they started using live ammunition in some of the scenes. Part of the time they were using sharpshooters, said Gray. If they wanted to really emphasise a scene, those sharpshooters would fire from up above. They'd start kicking up the sand pretty close to you. They were really good at what they did. We had a lot of fun and nobody got hurt. William Bendix, Preston Foster, Lloyd Nolan and Anthony Quinn were among the stars. But the six weeks passed all too quickly. Then it was back to the real-life 4th Amphibian Tractor Battalion, and Gray and the other Marines went straight into action. There was one driver, that was me, and two crewmen, Gray said. The landing ship, Tank, had three machine guns, 1.50 calibre and 2.30s, and they got a real workout. Our first stop was Roy Namur in the Marshall Islands. Then we went to Kwajalein Atoll. We landed with the assault troops, and this time the bullets were for real. I carried a .45 and one of those small M1 carbines. Our standard payload was 20 fully equipped Marines. If the Marines needed ammunition, we brought it in, and it was the real stuff. We took a platoon of Marines down about 40 miles and checked out all the islands there, Gray recalled. We'd move from island to island, checking to see if there were any Japanese on it. If there were, we'd let them have it. We were in and around Kwajalein for about 15 days. Then we went back to Maui, Hawaii and got new supplies, and then we were off again. This time the target was Saipan. My God, it was terrible, Gray remembered. There were lots of casualties, lots of losses, and the beach got so cluttered with tractors and boats in just a little while that there was hardly any place to land. We captured a Japanese major who said they never expected us to even get ashore. And if it hadn't been for the tractors, he would have been right. He made four landings that day, and every time it was just artillery and mortars, just like rain coming in, Gray remembered. And when we got enough people ashore, we started hauling supplies in and taking wounded marines out to the hospital ships. When the beach was cleared, we buried close to 12,000 bodies ourselves, and those caves they were sealing up, there's no telling how many bodies they held. The landing on Saipan had been a costly one on both sides, but there would be many more dead bodies to come. To Captain Edmund G. Love, who would go on to spend a large portion of his life writing about the exploits of his unit, the Army's 27th Infantry Division became his life and the centre of his universe. His comrades in arms took the places of his family. He talked with hundreds of infantrymen. In many cases, he watched them suffer and die. And when he asked them what it all meant, most of them talked of one vast, overwhelming desire, not to let their comrades down. There seemed to me to be no more compelling force than this one thing, Love wrote, comradeship. The 27th Infantry Division was a National Guard unit from the Apple Knocker country of upstate New York, when it was called into federal service by President Franklin Roosevelt in October 1940. A lot of the men were soldiers with Italian, Irish, Jewish, Polish and Russian names, 
Many were the sons of European immigrants. They came from Troy, Amsterdam, Saratoga Springs, Cohoes, Cobleskill, Cooperstown, New Baltimore and Lake George. But they all got along just fine. It was like a family gathering. Everyone was congenial, we had a lot of fun, said Sergeant Nicholas Grinaldo of C Company, 105th Infantry Regiment. We drilled about once a month, then we went to camp. We did manoeuvres in the field. The night before we left, one of the guys went to a house of ill repute in Troy. He picked up a dose of crabs, and he spread it through the whole 1st Battalion because we shared latrines. But they were all good guys. By the end of its wartime tour of duty almost five years later, it had lost much of its local character. Men from every state in the Union ended up serving in its ranks. On 15 October 1940, the entire division was put on a train to Fort McClellan in the deep south state of Alabama. There were high points along the way, like the time General George C. Marshall, Chief of Staff of the United States Army, put in an appearance at Fort McClellan to conduct an inspection tour of the 27th Division. But there were plenty of downers sandwiched in between. We marched through the streets of Anniston, Alabama to go to Fort McClellan, and they were up on the rooftops and out of the windows throwing bricks at us, Grinaldo remembered. They yelled, Yankee, go home! When we first got there, we slept in pup tents. They had no quarters for us. We were killing rattlesnakes and copperheads, and a bunch of the guys got bitten by them. After quitting school in the eighth grade and finding little work to do, Private First Class Frank Pusateri joined the 27th Division and became a member of D Company of the 105th Regiment. When I heard someone say what a beautiful place Alabama was, I was all for it, he remembered. But when I was done with it, one word more or less described it for me. Lousy. It started out by wallowing through Tennessee's red clay, he said and ended up in the loblolly of Louisiana, which was infinitely worse. The Southerners were awfully stiff with the boys from up north in the beginning, but the men from the 27th would have taken anything their southern counterparts could give and been happy about it if they'd known what the Japanese had in store for them. We went to Alabama, and they were still fighting the Civil War there, recalled Lieutenant Joseph Meigan, who was in charge of a mortar platoon of M Company, 3rd Battalion, 105th Infantry Regiment. There was a Mr. B on the radio. He had a drawl as thick as syrup, and he did not like these damn Yankees from up north. When we had leave, there was a little city in Georgia called Mineral Wells, and all the fellows who were looking for action got it, but then they gave it a nickname, Venereal Wells. Manoeuvres were like going hunting for two or three days. That's all it was said Mayen. You had a blue team and a red team and you're trying to eliminate the other guys. We weren't allowed to go into the cities. You were told not to make friends with the families. The funny thing is, every time we'd go on a drill or a twenty-mile hike, there was a farmhouse and a beautiful girl. We were told by our leaders to look straight ahead eyes left. Samuel Dinova dropped out of school in Troy after the eighth grade, when he was unable to find a job, he joined a civilian conservation corps camp to keep body and soul together. I just didn't think there was going to be any war, Dinova recalled, but a lot of my friends were joining the army for a year, and I decided I'd give it a try, so I enlisted. It paid dollar eighteen a month, which was a good bit of money, so I joined up and went with the National Guard guys down to Alabama. We were the Blue Army, and we fought the Red Army which was made up of guys in the 36th Infantry Division from Texas. We'd fight all week and then get a pass to go into Greenville, Mississippi or someplace like that. The manoeuvres lasted till the end of September of 1941, and then we went back to New York. My enlistment was up at that time, and I still didn't think there was going to be any war. It was a Sunday afternoon, and I was coming out of the Lincoln Theatre in Troy when I heard that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbour. Dinova said. It wasn't long before I got a notice to report back to active duty. That's how I ended up with a purple heart and a bronze star. I only had one more week to go, and then I'd be a free man because my year in the 27th Division's 105th Regiment would officially be up, recalled Private First Class Robert Cavell of Saratoga Springs. I was just back from Fort McClellan, and oh how I was looking forward to getting out of uniform and relaxing. Then his sergeant came rushing in and told everybody that the Japanese had just bombed Pearl Harbor. Cavell shook his head and shrugged. 
Well, I guess I won't be going home any time soon. I was right, Covell remembered. We stayed for about a week in New York. Then we loaded up and shipped out to Hawaii, and the next time we moved you could hear the bullets hitting. Most manoeuvres involved one factor, walking. When we were the Blue Army against the Red Army, it seemed like all we did was walk, Nick Grinaldo recalled. As far as tactics were concerned, I guess the upper brass knew what the hell they were doing, but to me it was nothing but walking all the time. After Fort McClellan and the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the 27th moved to northern Alabama to guard the Wilson Dam. They were there about two weeks, then they moved back to Fort McClellan. We stayed there for three or four days, said Grinaldo. Then we boarded trains for Fort Ord, California, filled up with more replacements and got all new equipment. Then the next thing we knew, we were on board the HMS Aquitania, sister ship of the Lusitania, whose sinking by a German submarine pushed the United States closer to war in 1915 and bound for Hawaii. The 27th became the first division to be declared combat ready and to leave the continental United States for overseas. Before it returned, its soldiers would fight at Makin, Eniwetok, Saipan, Tinian and Okinawa. You're not told a thing except to get aboard ship, Megan recalled. Then after a few days at sea you were told your destination. They break out the maps and you try to familiarise yourself with where you're going. While you're on the ship it seems like you'll never get there. The ships are zigzagging, there is naval protection in the form of submarines, but for entertainment there's nothing to do but read. Like a fool, I got on the bow of the ship and watched the little flying fish playing in the bow wake, jumping out of the water. At night you could sleep on deck for the fresh air, most everyone did. I lost my footlocker at sea when the rope line between ships broke, all my stuff went to the bottom. I think later on I got a check for fifty bucks. Along the way, Grinaldo was promoted from corporal to buck sergeant, then from buck sergeant to staff sergeant. Finally, I made platoon guide he said. I was second in command of the platoon if something happened to the platoon leader. Grinaldo was temporarily assigned to the 165th Regimental Combat Team that hit Makin and Enivetok, and he learned a lot. Rule number one, don't touch anything you don't have to because of booby traps, and don't get foolish and try to win the war by yourself because you can't do it. It's got to be a group effort. After that, they returned to Hawaii, but there was no time to rest. Get ready to move out, they were told when the time came. A few days later, they were headed to Saipan. Private John Early of the 27th Division's 165th Infantry Regiment remembers listening to the ship's public address system off the coast of Saipan in the early morning of 16 June to stay informed about the Marines' progress. Everything looked good at first. They kept telling us that all was well and nobody expected us to land, Early recalled. Then all hell broke loose, horns blasting, and the soldiers were ordered to their landing stations. The result was mass confusion. A rumour spread like wildfire as Early climbed down to his assault boat. It said that the Marines were being pushed back and might lose the beachhead, that they were being hit hard from the rear. But instead of heading toward the beaches, the boat started circling and circling again and again, and it went on for hours. I don't believe any of us thought we could survive this night, Early said. Everyone was exhausted long before we hit the beach. The arrival of the 27th Division on Saipan was definitely not a study in close order drill. By the time most of the men were loaded onto boats, it was already totally dark. The first troops to reach the beach were from the 2nd Battalion of the 165th Infantry Regiment. They arrived in a hopelessly separated and uncoordinated mass of boats that landed all the way from the green beaches on the north to the yellow beaches on the south, instead of the blue beaches where they should have been. In most cases, the coxswains, finally tired of circling aimlessly, drove their boats up to the reef and ordered the troops into the water, even though it was neck deep in some places. Scores of dead marines lay on the beach in the half-light of the flares and exploding shells. Early and a close friend, Private Arthur Conlon, jumped into a large shell hole and both fell asleep from exhaustion. They woke up shortly after daylight to find that two dead Marines were occupying the hole with them. Private Clifford Howe of Havre, Montana, expected to move towards Saipan immediately. But he and the rest of C Company, 1st Battalion of the 165th Infantry Regiment, 
ended up circling endlessly for several hours. Their Amtrak finally headed for the beach at about four on 17 June. As he neared the battle zone, Howe was struck by a grim realisation. He was at the very front on the boat. He was afraid he'd be the first casualty when the ramp dropped. But Howe was fortunate. He moved through the shallow surf until he could fall into the wet sand. Then he advanced on his stomach. Howe served as a radio operator for Captain Paul Ryan, who was not so lucky. That afternoon, he was killed by a mortar that struck a rock next to him. Sergeant Edwin Luck lucked out on the first assignment he was given as a leader of the 1st Squad, 1st Platoon of G Company of the 105th Infantry Regiment. There was no opposition to our landing, he remembers, but we got all hung up on the reefs and we couldn't go any place. We had to transfer into amphibious tractors. We landed at Charon Canoa. Then it got really bad. We suffered a lot of casualties. One of our own cruisers moved in and mistakenly wiped out one of our battalion headquarters. That was their first taste of combat. The mortars luck and the men of the 27th used in training weren't actual mortars. They were pieces of wood painted olive green, so they had to pretend a little. I think there was one actual mortar in the whole regiment, he said. The mortar squads were familiar with the sight mechanism and all the gears that went with a mortar, but they had zero experience with the actual weapon. The Japanese foes that Luck and the other members of the 27th Division fought were superb fighters. They were very skilled soldiers and were first-rate at fighting you to a standstill. We found this out in the middle of a sugarcane field, Luck said, with Japanese lying in there hidden under the sugarcane. None of us could see them, but they had no trouble at all seeing us. Captain William Corcoran joined the 27th Division when he was barely 15 years old, quite possibly becoming its youngest ever member. It was in the depths of the Depression in 1933, and he was fairly tall, so they let him in. What followed for young Corcoran was probably the quickest round of promotions that any 15-year-old has ever seen, first to private first class, then to corporal, then to first sergeant, and he was still only 16 years old. They had him train all the recruits that came in, maybe because he was nearer their age. By the time the war started, Corcoran was a lieutenant. When Pearl Harbour was bombed, they sent him off to artillery school, and he emerged as a 26-year-old captain. And before going to Macon Island as his first assignment, they gave him a job as operations officer for the 24th Corps. We cleaned up Macon in three days, and they wrote me up for a bronze star for devising a plan for landing my men, he recalled. The funny thing about it was... I wasn't even mentioned in the Admiral's statement. They sent the medal over, and I didn't even know about it in advance. But I'll tell you this. When we landed on Makin, not a single shot was fired at us. Now he hoped they could do the same at Saipan. The first apple knockers to reach the beach were from the 2nd Battalion of the 165th Infantry Regiment. These men waded onto dry land two full hours after they had left the rendezvous area. Lieutenant Colonel Joseph Hart immediately ordered a system of patrols out to find and assemble the various units of the regiment on Blue Beach. This was a task that took well over an hour, and even then the entire regiment was not found. Company commanders searched until the wee hours of the morning, scrambling around in the darkness and gathering as many of their own men as they could find. At one point, Captain Lawrence O'Brien of a company of the 165th was challenged by a sentry who told him that a probable enemy counter-landing was expected on the beach, and no one had told him that the 165th was coming ashore. The fact that the sentry verbally challenged O'Brien before he opened fire prevented what would have amounted to an all-American slaughter. Units of the 165th were ordered to move to the far right side, the southern side of the marine lines, and prepare to attack in the direction of the Aslito airfield on the morning of 17 June. The scattered soldiers of the regiment made their way down the beach, hugging the waterline to avoid both enemy artillery and marine patrols that might mistake them for Japanese. Once they found the blue beaches, it took about five hours in the darkness, with the only light coming from artillery flashes, the movement of the 165th Infantry Regiment south from there was an unbelievably slow and tedious process. Colonel Hart was forced to halt his men every few yards, answer challenges and identify his command. The men were confined to a narrow strip of sand along the water's edge 
to avoid contact with the units of marines they continued to encounter. They were sometimes in the water, sometimes not. The men later dubbed Colonel Hart Jumping Joe for the number of times he led them to sprawl flat on the ground and get back up again. The name would stick with him for the rest of his Pacific career. One more serious challenge awaited the 165th Infantry Regiment. The troops, faced with crossing a thousand yards of open ground just as dawn was breaking, operated at double time just as Japanese shelling began. The last soldier in the column, a man from B Company, was the only casualty. He was struck by fragments of the first shell to land in the area. It was almost full light of another day, 17 June. We went in with the Marines to support them, and there was an awful lot of small arms fire, recalled Private First Class Donald Elliott, assistant driver of a tank in the Army's 708th Amphibious Tank Battalion, and also the operator of a .30 caliber machine gun on the front of the tank. After spending a year at Camp Chaffee in the constant company of the 27th Division, Elliot had assumed it would be troops of the 27th he would be ushering ashore. As it turned out, it was the Marines who marched close behind the tanks, and the 27th followed in their wake when they came ashore. The men of the 27th soon found out that the amphibious tanks were definitely not up to par. One point thirty caliber bullet in the right place would knock one out. The armour in the tank was next to no armour at all. There were 25 tanks in the 708th Battalion, divided into five platoons with five member tanks each. But the Japanese had a wide variety of weapons to cope with them, including a 37mm gun that no one in the battalion could locate. The Japanese were continuously moving it from place to place and putting new camouflage on it. They also had an old Swiss gun that knocked out four United States tanks in quick succession until a gunner finally spotted it and put a shot right into it. The 27th Division was realigned by morning, and their first attack was scheduled for 11.30 on the Aslito airfield, near the southern end of the island. The American brass wanted very urgently to capture the airfield, which in coming months would allow them to have direct access by the new B-29 superfortresses to the home islands of Japan. A large part of the job was given to the 1st and 2nd battalions of the 165th Regiment, and they pressed the attack that morning. Their goals were the airfield and nearby Nafutan Point, located just southeast of the airfield. The Japanese had about 1,500 troops infesting the ridges behind the airfield, and another 500 supporting them at Nafutan Point. The first attack on the airfield was a complete washout. The Japanese artillery defending the airfield was not where it was supposed to be, according to sketchy American intelligence. Instead of on a high ridge to the south, the heaviest weaponry was concentrated on Nafutan Point, an appendage of land jutting into the ocean near the airfield and separated from it by heavy undergrowth and coral outcroppings. The generally accepted theory that the Japanese could see infantry movements in the island's vast sugarcane fields was seriously flawed. The 27th quickly learned. The Japanese troops were high enough on the upper ridges to look down and trace every movement in the cane fields, then lay down deadly, accurate fire on the 27th Infantry. When the first assault failed, a second attack was to kick off at 12.30 on 17 June after a brief round of United States artillery fire, but it bogged down within a few minutes in the face of intense enemy fire. For two hours, the United States artillery bombarded the ridge from a distance, but the barrage did little damage to the Japanese defensive line. The airfield itself was undefended, but on the reverse slope of a ridge above it, the Japanese had built some pillboxes and other fortifications, and these fortifications were the key to the airfield. As long as the slope remained in Japanese hands, the airfield could not be safely captured or supplied, much less have United States planes taking off from it. The two unsuccessful attempts to take the high ground had been due largely to the failure of American artillery to damage the enemy holding it. It was also the failure of United States support fire to keep the Japanese underground long enough for infantry to reach them and destroy them. The solution was to call in the 249th Field Artillery to add to the amount of fire placed on the hill. The second was to move the cruiser USS Louisville up the Saipan Channel to the east, to a point where she could bring her guns to bear on the reverse slopes of the ridge. The use of a couple of tanks also helped. 
The tide didn't turn until the morning of 18 June. With twice as many troops in line as on the previous day, and with tanks laying down supporting fire in front of the troops, the enemy held ridge was captured with very little actual fighting. The Japanese had pulled back to Nafutan Point, which would give the 27th Division pure hell for close to a week. The airfield itself, though, was a lost cause for the Japanese. Shortly before, nine large numbers of enemy soldiers were reported withdrawing from the battle area. The ridge that had caused so much trouble the day before was basically abandoned, opening the way for a remarkably easy capture of Aslito Airfield. In addition to planting artillery on Nafutan Point, many of the Japanese troops leaving the airfield were withdrawing toward Mount Tapochao, the highest point on the island, in the highly defensible mountainous terrain of central Saipan. With no hope of being relieved or resupplied, winning the battle had basically turned hopeless for the defenders. But the Japanese were determined to fight to the last man. Their leader, General Saito, organised his troops along a ridge where heavily armed soldiers could fire directly down on the Americans. The nicknames given to various places in the area, Hell's Pocket, Purple Heart Ridge and Death Valley, told of the brutal difficulties facing the Marines and the 27th Division in the tortuous terrain. The Americans gradually developed tactics for clearing the many caves in the volcanic landscape, using flamethrower teams supported by artillery and machine guns, but it was slow, gruelling, dangerous work. For the record, Colonel Gerard Kelly, commanding the 165th Infantry Regiment, attacked ahead of schedule on 18 June and captured Aslito Airfield. He did it almost without firing a shot, when two previous attacks by the 27th Division had gained nothing. We walked right across that field in a skirmish line, and not a damned shot was fired at us, said Sergeant Grinaldo. We got to the other side, and we were told to dig in again because they figured a counter-attack was coming, but it never developed. Staff Sergeant Jack Lent of the 2nd Marines from Dallas was pretty sure that a bullet that grazed his head and left him unconscious was as close as he'd ever come to dying in battle. But he was wrong. I was sort of feeling sorry for the Japanese. I thought, God, they're going to wipe them out, the poor things. The Marines found out later that they probably didn't even kill one Japanese with all that shelling. Lent got ashore underneath a pier that reached out into the ocean. About half of the men got out of the boat and went under the pier, and about half of them stayed in the boat. Then the boat took a direct artillery hit and got blown apart. Everyone in the boat was killed. It seemed to Lent that he spent eight or ten hours under that pier, all the while trying to get ashore but hopelessly pinned down by the constant machine gun fire. When he finally made it to the beach, it was pitch dark. The next day he found his commanding officer, Colonel David Shoup, who told Lent, We're getting awfully bad sniper fire coming at us. Get up on that pillbox and see if you can tell where that fire is coming from. Lent and another man climbed up on the pillbox, where they spotted a Japanese hiding in a coconut tree. They both fired at him, and he came down head first and hit the ground. Lent was elated and had begun looking around to see if he could spot another Japanese when a bullet ripped right through his helmet and knocked him out cold. He woke up with Shoup pouring brandy down his throat. That brought me around real quick, he said, and I felt my head to see what was left up there, but all I could feel was a little cut on the top of my skull. A little blood was running out of the cut, so they took Lent over to sickbay and patched him up. When they were finished, they handed him his helmet. He took a peek at the massive hole in it. The round would have torn his head off. After he recovered, Lent was assigned to take over duties as an air observer at Aslito Airfield. When the plane he was aboard started to come in for a landing, he looked out the window and yelled to the pilot. Hey, you can't land down there, he said, looking out. My God, they're still fighting for the airstrip. You'll get us all killed. But I've got to land, the pilot said. I don't have enough fuel to fly around all day. We've got no choice. I've got to land. The plane touched down, and when it did, it was literally riddled with bullets that went through the wings and fuselage. Everybody inside jumped out on the tarmac and ran like hell. By some quirk of fate, a marine in a jeep appeared from somewhere and screeched to a halt. You crazy people, he said. Why are you landing? Can't you see we haven't taken the airport yet? Somehow the man driving the jeep got out to the Marine Corps line without anybody getting shot. The next day, Lent had to take up his duties as an air observer. He had to watch everybody, 
even if they were going up in a PBY, a light cargo plane with no armour. That was his duty, just flying over to spot where the enemy was and relaying it to the commanding officer. But a funny thing happened as Lent was flying over the mountains. He spotted his old group, huddled up in an observation post. He recognised who they were and dropped a message down to them. I'll see you guys pretty soon, it read. A couple of days later he found an old Japanese bicycle, got on it and rode up the mountain to visit his buddies he hadn't seen in six or eight months. They had a good reunion, and as he was preparing to leave somebody asked, How in the world did you get up here? He said, Well, I rode right up that main road on this bicycle. Holy shit, the soldier said, but we haven't captured that road yet. Lent had ridden through the Japanese lines on that bicycle, and now he had to go back that same way. I think I went back about 90 miles an hour on that bike, he remembered. When Lent got back to Hawaii, he put his helmet in a box and mailed it to his mother. In the meantime, the War Department had sent her a telegram stating that Lent had been wounded in action, but she hadn't yet received it. She got that helmet first and thought I was dead, Lent said. The Dallas Morning News came over and took pictures of the helmet with my mother holding it and crying. It was the saddest picture you ever saw. I called her as soon as I was able and told her I was fine. The first thing she wanted to know was how my head was. A Sleeto airfield was under the full control of American forces on 18 June, and within four days flights of 74 P-47 Thunderbolt fighters were providing support for United States ground troops. The field was found to be in relatively good condition, and it contained the largest cache of airplane parts and damaged aircraft captured from the Japanese up to that time. By the next day, CBs with bulldozers were working on the field to clear it. Also discovered and put to good use were an oxygen tank, a power plant, a million-gallon reservoir, and a number of shelters and warehouses with steel-reinforced concrete walls. Japanese troops had moved out in such haste that no demolition or destruction had been carried out. Thanks to the Battle of the Philippine Sea and the downing of hundreds of Japanese planes, the P-47s had almost no enemy planes in the area to interfere with them. Meanwhile, the 165th and elements of the 4th Marine Division had arrived at Magician Bay on the east coast of Saipan, isolating the southern part of the island. Earlier, two battalions of the 165th Infantry Regiment were contesting Japanese forces at Aslito Airfield and Nafutan Point. The 105th Regiment and the rest of the 165th, temporarily stranded by a shortage of Amtraks, reached land without incident. Many, however, had to wade ashore in chest-deep water to reach the town of Charan Kanoa, or what was left of it. There was nothing but twisted wreckage everywhere, and plenty of dead Japanese. Nevertheless, General Holland Smith and his Chief of Staff, Brigadier General Graves B. Bobby Erskine, the youngest Brigadier General in the Marine Corps, came ashore and established a headquarters at Charan Kanoa. For reasons best known to him, Holland Smith never visited the front lines, Instead, he received his information from Erskine, though for a period of approximately two weeks, Erskine also avoided the front lines. As Holland Smith put it, he was a brilliant staff officer. His office buzzed with activity, and his only regret was that he could not get away more frequently to visit the front. For nearly two weeks, his personal knowledge of Saipan was limited to the area immediately adjacent to our quarters. Duty tied him to his desk. Erskine did supposedly remain in constant contact with officers in the 2nd and 4th Marines, and he met with Holland Smith two or three times a day to discuss the current situation and make plans for the following day. Just how much, if any, of Erskine's long-distance communications problem affected Holland Smith's advanced planning is still unknown today. Early in the afternoon of 18 June, the 1st Battalion of the 105th Regiment commanded by Lieutenant Colonel William O'Brien, got its first taste of action in the fight for Saipan. O'Brien, 45, had joined the 27th Division in 1918 during World War I, and he'd been with the division ever since. Before the Battle of Saipan was over, O'Brien and two other members of the regiment would be caught up in some of the fiercest fighting of the war, and all three of them would receive the Medal of Honour. O'Brien was like a banty rooster, remembered Lieutenant Joe Megan, 
He was the kind of guy who would go out and do it himself before he'd tell you to do it. On 18 June, O'Brien's inexperienced troops were given the job of fighting their way eastward across the island. At first, they made rapid progress, but the next day they ran into serious problems. Concentrated in an area known as Ridge 300, the Japanese had dug several strong points and pillboxes into the hilly, rocky terrain. Several 1st Battalion soldiers, faced with constant fire, volunteered to infiltrate enemy lines to destroy those positions, but machine gun fire and grenades pushed them back. Late in the afternoon, Sergeant Thomas Baker borrowed a bazooka from a comrade. He walked out under heavy fire, knelt down, and fired his weapon into a dual-purpose gun position, knocking it out with his second round. Then he stood up and ran back to his company with machine gun bullets dancing around him all the way. His action ultimately enabled his company to take the ridge. Staff Sergeant Floyd Mummy was one of the few Texans, if not in fact the only one, to become a member of the 27th Infantry Division in the early days of World War II. Mummy graduated from high school in 1936 in Alfred, Texas, and he was happily driving a truck for a local lumberyard and working in the oil business when he learned that the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor. He was out hunting that morning when he heard it on the car radio. At 23 he was single and knew there was little doubt he'd be called up quickly. But it happened the very next day, on 8 December, and he was sworn in on 9 December. Mummer could scarcely believe he was in the United States Army Medical Corps. We didn't have any choice in those days. We were just numbers, he remembered. They didn't pay any attention to your qualifications or anything. Later on, I think they did, but we got up there that day and everything was so messed up. They came down and rounded us up like a bunch of billy goats. The recruits were sent to Camp Barkley, a training camp about 30 miles south of Abilene, Texas. The training started with 3,100 men, and after six weeks they had a first shipment of 360 men ready to go. Mumi was the 17th man called. They were put on a train that had priority all the way to the west coast. They were still planning to try to get a division of troops in to save the Philippines, but by the time he got there they'd changed their minds. That was supposed to be the role of the 27th Army Division, but they had backed off because the Japanese had taken over too much of the Philippines by then. When the recruits got to Hawaii, they were trained briefly with rifles. They claimed we were the only medical corps group that ever got that training, Mummy said. Otherwise we did stuff on bandages, how to splint things and how to clean a wound out, how to give shots and give first aid. And marching, oh yeah, there was a lot of marching. A total of 28 medics were attached to the Marine Corps for the trip to Saipan, each one from the 27th Division. When Saipan was over, they would return to the 27th, if any of them were still around. In addition to the medics, there were also six doctors, Mumme and the other medics were loaded down with medical equipment. Mumme had no rifle, but he had medical pouches hanging around his waist on both sides. He carried sterile bandages and plenty of an antibacterial they used for infection in those days. Conditions on the beach had been considerably worse a few minutes before the medical team landed, but now the second marines had the Japanese backed up far enough that when the medics landed, they had to go around the second marines to get to the fourth marines, which was where they were supposed to be. Mummer found himself surrounded by wrecked boats, debris of all kinds and casualties. Far too many, he said. We had an awful job of getting this one guy to stop bleeding. We did everything we could, and we thought we had saved him. And then he was hit by a damned stray bullet that finished him off just when we thought we had him stabilised. Mummy was on hand when the first hospital ship sailed away. It was loaded to the brim, carrying more than 600 patients, Shortly after that, he and the other members of the medical team joined the engineers in constructing a new evacuation hospital on the island. The toughest thing he ever did was help on an amputation in which both legs had to come off above the knees. The doctors used us medics like nurses, he recalled. I was there with forceps to pinch back the blood veins. Then they pulled all the way up your leg muscles and cut it where they could still pull something back over the bone. Years later, when Mummer saw a man with two legs missing, he thought it might be the same guy. They said he was a Marine and a World War II veteran, but I couldn't quite bring myself to go up to him and ask him about it. Myron Bazaar came to America from the Ukraine when he was barely five years old. 
His mother and father were divorced, and his father had custody of the boy. They settled in Amsterdam, New York, where Bazaar graduated from high school in the spring of 1941. At the time, many male high school graduates, including some of Myron's best friends, were joining the Army National Guard. But Bazaar was in love with the Navy. I always wanted to join the Navy, he remembered. I don't know exactly why. When President Roosevelt announced he was spending a billion dollars on the Navy, I was really enthused. I was only two blocks from the post office, where the Navy recruiting officer was stationed, when the announcement was made that the Navy would be under the draft system. I heard about it on my car radio. I went straight there and told him I wanted to join up. Bazaar and other recruits went to Albany and boarded a train going to Newport, Rhode Island, where they spent the next three months in training. But when it was completed, he was told he would be going to Boston for more training. You're going to the Wentworth Institute, which is a technical school that's been taken over by the Navy to train engineers, an officer told him. The best part is that you're going to stay at the Somerset Hotel, the best lodging in the Back Bay section of Boston. The young Navy recruit found the Wentworth Institute amazing. They took me to Boston, and this hotel was unbelievable, Bazaar said. They kept the same staff, used the same kitchen, the same chef, the same waiters, the same food they served the civilians. The programme was four months long, and I was relieved of all duties except studying. I had weekends off, and I brought my car, a 1941 Plymouth, up from Amsterdam, and spent the evenings cruising around Boston. Along with all this, he found time to study the engineering of pumps, turbines, steering mechanisms, refrigeration, and other technical aspects aboard ships. When it came time to graduate with a rank of petty officer, his commanding officer called him in and said, you're a lucky guy. Washington's decided to send you to Syracuse for additional training. In what? Bazaar asked. The Carrier Corporation has a small school there where they teach refrigeration and air conditioning, and you've been selected to go there. Bazaar laughed as he remembered it. You'll get an allowance, and you can live any place you want. You'll have to be at work at eight o'clock in the morning, and you're out at four or five o'clock in the afternoon. You're on your own. Bazaar studied at Carrier with ten other Navy students, all of them learning air conditioning and refrigeration. After about five weeks, he took a train to San Francisco, where a new fleet oil tanker was under construction. He was assigned to handle all the air conditioning for officers' quarters. Before leaving, Petty Officer Bazaar sold his two-year-old 1941 Plymouth for $1,100. He'd only paid $700 for it brand new, during the train ride along the way, he discovered another America. The train would stop in these small towns out in the Midwest, wherever a water tower was located, he said, and the women from these towns would come down to the train with food and clothing and everything they could possibly give you that you might need. They'd give you sweaters and socks and sandwiches. They were too remote from the big cities to do anything in the factories, but what they could do is give whatever they could to the troops. In San Francisco, the ship was being built in a new Kaiser shipbuilding plant, and Bazaar was told it would take four months to complete. There's only seven Navy men aboard, he was told. You're one of the seven. All the rest are civilian workers. Your job is going to be to walk around and make sure everybody's working and nobody's sleeping. You'll be given a sizable allowance for food and clothing. Good luck. By this time, Bazaar was getting used to being spoiled. They gave me an armband that said SP Foreshore Patrol. For four months, I couldn't find a person who was sloughing off or sleeping or doing anything wrong. Everybody was so patriotic. It was unbelievable. At that time, Americans' feelings weren't so much against Hitler as they were against Tojo because of what he'd done at Pearl Harbor, he said. Americans had the feeling that, we're going to get those Japanese if it's the last thing we do. Even when we got involved in the war in Europe, it was never Hitler. It was, let the Europeans take care of Hitler, we'll take care of Tojo. After four months, the ship was ready to go. There were two fleets, the Third Fleet and the Seventh Fleet. We were with the Third Fleet, all the new stuff, battleships like the New Jersey and Wisconsin, and all the new carriers. We stayed with the fleet. We went everywhere with them, slightly and back. Our first trip was to the Aleutians, Bazaar said. They needed the fuel for airplanes and oil for the ships. So we went up to the Aleutians in the month of January. That was a disaster. We spent a month there. 
When all the ice froze on that ship, everything was frozen. We had to chip the ice off the walkways. We put ropes in walking areas, something to hang on to so you didn't slip. He was gone for about two months, sometimes as much as three. He accumulated six separate battle stars for the invasions he was in. Hawaii was his next stop. He saw a bunch of old buddies from the 27th Division, guys from Troy and Albany. Then he found out what was coming up next, the invasion of Saipan.